Um, there's a time-honored tradition among scholars and writers um, when they write books to um, thank those who have been their mentors but take um, responsibility for any errors in their books. And I, I'm neither a writer nor um, a, a scholar, but um, I, I mention this because uh, Rob was my former boss at the International Crisis Group for four years, and Omer was one of my first professors in graduate school. Um, we used to call him Doogie Hauser PhD because he was so young. Um, um, but um, I, I thought in, in kind of a Persian tradition, rather than um, taking um, credit for my own potential errors in this presentation, I'd like to deflect some of the accountability to Rob and to, to Omar. <laughs> um, so I thought what I'd do is talk briefly about the domestic situation in Iran and then talk about Iran's uh, vision for the Middle East and, and how Iran's ambitions are playing out. Um, um, the trend lines in Iran in many ways are the opposite of the trend lines in the Arab world, meaning in the Arab world, power is going from um, being uh, uh, centralized to being quite diffuse. And in Iran, the trend lines over the last decade or two has been, have been the opposite, in that power um, uh, was much more factionalized and diffuse. Um, but over the last decade, uh, power and influence and decisions in Iran are increasingly driven by one individual, one personality. That's that of the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei. And kind of a shorthand way of, of looking at Iran domestically is to say that, um, you know, um, uh, Iran is driven by uh, the, the worldview of Khamenei in the same way in which, you know, Egypt was driven by Mubarak, Syria, by Assad, etc. And um, Khamenei has now been supreme leader for 22 years, and he has a, a fairly shrewd modus operandi, which is to try to wield power without accountability. And in order to wield power without accountability, he needs a president who has accountability without power. And President Ahmadinejad has, has uh, up until recently, played that role fairly conveniently. Um, but I think what we've seen over the last year or so is there's been, been, there's been tension uh, in that um, Ahmadinejad seems no longer content with simply being um, Khamenei's loyal subordinate, Khamenei's loyal um, lieutenant. Um, and there are tensions between the two of them. Um, but I think when it comes to the Iranian nuclear program, um, major domestic decisions, and Iran's role in the Middle East, um, decisions are very much driven by, by Khamenei and the Revolutionary Guards who act at his behest. And Khamenei's view of the Middle East has always been that the more democracy there is in the Middle East, the more representative governments there are in the Middle East, the better it is for Iran. Um, he's seen over the last decade or so that when democratic elections have taken place in Lebanon, um, um, it empowered Hezbollah, when democratic elections took place in Palestine, it empowered Hamas. When democratic elections took place in Iraq, it empowered Shiite Islamists. So he's confident that um, the average um, citizen in the Middle East um, has much more in common with Tehran's worldview than Washington's worldview. So that's, um, and, and I think when the, the um, uprisings began in the Arab world, Khamenei felt fairly confident that this was going in line with Iran's interests, not, not American interests. Um, but I would argue that so far the results have been decidedly mixed for Iran. Um, I'll start by talking briefly about Egypt and say that the, the dynamics in Egypt are going to be likely mixed for Iran in that uh, on one hand, uh, Whatever the post, wherever the cards happen to fall um, in Egypt, um, it's, it's fairly likely that uh, post Mubarak Egypt um, is going to have a better bilateral relationship with Iran than Mubarak era Egypt. So the bilateral relationship between Egypt and Iran is likely going to improve. Um, but at the same time, I would argue that one of the reasons for Iran's ascent in the Middle East over the course of the last decade has been as a result of Egypt's decline over the last decade. And I think in the coming years, it's obviously going to take um, 
many months and years before Egypt is ready to look externally. It's still very far, focused internally. But once I think Egypt does start to focus externally, um, the return of of a proud and assertive Egypt is going to challenge Iran in many arenas like the Levant and the Gulf and elsewhere. So that's point number one. Uh, point number two um, is I- Iran's relationship and Iran's rivalry with Saudi Arabia. And I would argue that the two countries are trying to forward two very different paradigms for the Middle East. The Saudi paradigm is a very sectarian paradigm, and their, their calculations are are purely demographic, and that's to say that um, around 90% of the region's Muslims are Sunni. Iran is Shiite, so let's wave the, the, the Sunni banner um, in order to undermine Iran in these Sunni countries. And, and Iran's paradigm is the imperialist versus the anti-imperialist um, uh, to, to um, paint countries uh, like um, um, you know, the, the Bahraini ruling family um, or, or what, you know, Mubarak's Egypt was, the Jordanian ruling family, as being lackeys of the United States um, um, against kind of the, the resistance, um, Hamas, Hezbollah, more Islamist groups. And, and I would argue that neither one of these paradigms um, has um, tremendous buying power um, these days in the Middle East. And that's a good segue to talk briefly about Turkey and the growing rivalry between Iran and Turkey. And Omar, I'm sure, is going to touch upon this as well. But I think that this has been a point which has been somewhat um, misunderstood in Washington when when, um, there's talk about this growing um, alliance between Turkey and Iran. Because I think the reality is that um, in various arenas throughout the Middle East, um, the two countries are, uh, um, are increasingly competing for power and for for influence. And uh, I'll share with you an anecdote which for me kind of crystallized Iran's vision for the Middle East as opposed to say Turkey's vision for the Middle East. Um, uh, Several years back, I was at at a track two meeting in Europe and uh, there was an Iranian official present, a deputy foreign minister. And I relayed to him a question which um, a Lebanese Shiite friend of mine once posed to me. He said to me, think about all the um, money Iran has spent over the years on Hezbollah. Since Hezbollah's inception in 1982, it's a conservative estimate is a couple billion dollars. And think of how many Lebanese Shiites Iran could have sent abroad, educated to become doctors and, and professionals and, 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 uh, and engineers. And how much better off the, the Shiite community in Lebanon would have been, even vis-a-vis Israel, with, with those types of um, academic opportunities. And, and likewise, the Palestinians, instead of you know, spending this money over the years arming um, Hamas and Islamic Jihad, how many Palestinian youth could have, Iran could have educated and, and, and sent abroad over the years um, to become members of the, the professional classes? So I posed this question to this Iranian um, deputy foreign minister, and he said, what good would that have done for Iran? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, do you think had we sent these young Lebanese Shiites and Palestinians abroad to become doctors and lawyers and engineers that they would like to come back to South Lebanon and Gaza and fight Israel? He said, no, of course, they, they would have liked to remain doctors and lawyers and engineers. Um, so, so I think what this crystallized for me is that Iran is cognizant of its strengths and weaknesses and is cognizant of the fact that it can be champion of the region's mostazafon, as we call them, champion of the region's downtrodden and alienated and disenfranchised. Um, But they're cognizant of the fact that they can't necessarily be the champion of the region's upwardly mobile and professional classes. So I would argue, in a way, Iran uh, benefits the most when the region is in the throes of uh, tumult and chaos and when people feel most outraged and, and disenfranchised. And, and um, there was a, a, an interesting um, passage from Tony Blair's recent autobiography, which jumped out at me. And, and Blair was talking about his, uh, his transition from the old labor party to new labor. And he said the, the thing about old labor was that they were really interested in celebrating the working class, but they didn't seem too focused on turning the working class into the middle class. And I think that, you know, that's, that's Iran's um, uh, strategy. And I think that, in a way, 
Um, Turkey is becoming the new labor to Iran's old labor in the Middle East, meaning um, young, uh, upwardly mobile, aspiring Arabs um, don't aspire to um, live in a system like the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, and that Turkish model is increasingly becoming the model which people look to because Turkey, like no other country in the region, no other country in Middle East history, has managed to reconcile how you can simultaneously be modern and Muslim and democratic. This is the, these kind of three things simultaneously, I would argue, no Muslim country in the region has managed to, to yet reconcile. So, so again, I, I would just argue that um, um, Turkey and Iran are, are increasingly going to be competitors in the region rather than allies. And Iraq is going to be an important uh, arena of competition between the two of them because arguably no country in the world stands to benefit more from Iraq's burgeoning um, energy resources than, than Turkey. And arguably no country in the world stands to lose more from Iraq's burgeoning energy, energy industry than, than Iran. So I think there's going to be some tension there. Um, with regards to um, um, Syria, and this is when I said that you know, the Arab Spring is, 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 is decidedly mixed for Iran. I think the Iranians anticipated that the uprisings would only occur in countries which were aligned with the West, whether that was Egypt or, um, or Tunisia or Bahrain. Uh, and they, they really didn't anticipate uh, this uprising in Syria. And why this is so troubling for Iran is the fact that Syria has been Iran's only consistent ally, not only consistent regional ally, but consistent global ally since the 1979 revolution. Um, uh, Syria, um, you know, I I Iran's patronage of Hezbollah, which has been the crown jewel of the Iranian revolution, um, is going to be very difficult to sustain in the same fashion absent that Syrian causeway. And, and, and I would argue, you know, just in terms of their, their strategy in Syria, um, their, their philosophy at home, whenever the regime is under siege, is, is, is not to compromise at all because they believe that when you start to um, compromise, um, that actually emboldens the opposition. It projects weakness and, and emboldens the opposition. Um, and I would argue that that's probably been their advice to Assad, to basically hold on um, and not give an inch because if he starts to give an inch, people are going to ask for six inches. Um, and, and, and I would argue that that's what they're doing operationally there have been some statements um, in recent months, not from Ayatollah Khamenei, but from President Ahmadinejad, um, condemning some of the violence. But, but in general, I, I think that um, um, the loss of the Assad regime would be a tremendous uh, blow for Iran. Now, um, briefly on, on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, another um, um, ramification um, which may not have... Um, um, positive results for Iran is, is, uh, is, is related to Syria, and that's uh, Hamas's potential relocation from, from Damascus to Doha, to, to Qatar. And there's already um, reports, um, and, and I'm not sure if these have been corroborated, but um, reports that um, Iran um, has threatened to withhold funding to uh, Hamas if they abandon the Assads and they relo relo relocate to Qatar. But, but again, the, the fall of the Assad regime in Iran could have you know, important implications for Iran's approach to, to, to Palestinian politics as well. And let me just end on um, how the uprisings in the Arab world may have influenced Iran's nuclear calculations. And um, for, for, for several years now, um, there's been a conventional wisdom that um, Iran is in pursuit of a nuclear weapons capability. Uh, they want to um, pursue the so-called Japan model, which is to remain a screwdriver turn away from having a weapon, but stopping short of, of actually um, um, building and, and testing a, a nuclear device. And I think the experience in uh, Libya, the, the, the um, experience of Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, uh, may have altered somewhat the calculations of the Iranian supreme leader. Um, um, there was a very interesting article which came out in the New York Times um, 
right around the time of the, shortly after um, the, the decision to go into Libya, the NATO intervention in Libya, and I was quoting a senior White House official, and the senior White House official said that um, one of our calculations for, for um, going into Libya was to send a message to Iran that if, if that they shouldn't think that they can simply slaughter their own population and the United States will stay on the sidelines and sit on their hands. And the message which Iran received from the intervention in Libya was decidedly different. And the Iranian Supreme Leader gave uh, a speech around that same time as the, the New York Times article came out saying that the main mistake of Muammar Gaddafi was giving up his nuclear program because when he gave up his nuclear program, um, that made him vulnerable to this type of outside intervention. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is that the, 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 the strategy of the United States, and I'm not necessarily saying it's an incorrect strategy, but the strategy of the United States is to subject Iran to significant pressure um, in order to compel it to come back to the negotiating table and make meaningful compromises on its nuclear program. And looking at the world from the eyes of Ayatollah Khamenei, um, and increasingly his back is up against the wall with these very draconian sanctions against Iran's central bank and a currency crisis and a disgruntled population. It's unclear to me whether he will seek uh, salvation in a nuclear compromise with the West or whether he will seek salvation uh, in a nuclear weapon. So uh, on that happy note, let me hang, hand it over to Omar.